Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight is Comprehensivist Wednesdays. This is a joint meetup between 52 Living Ideas and the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. Uh, tonight we'll be covering the chronophiles, data mining your life for comprehensive thinking. CJ, take it away. Okay, welcome to Comprehensivist Wednesdays, our ongoing series of weekly events designed to foster the art of comprehensivity, our learning practices for building an ever more extensive, ever more intensive, and ever more integrated understanding of our worlds and its peoples. Some of the most important values for our comprehensivity are listed in a quote from T.C. Chamberlain. The thoroughness, the completeness, the all-sidedness, the impartiality. Succeeding in understanding our worlds and its peoples impartially, completely, and from all sides may be impossible for any one human being. However, it is my conviction that adopting these values for our comprehensivity new worlds of learning can open that may not be possible through other approaches. Tonight, there will be three segments with interactive discussion after each. If any of you are new, that means you will be asked during the interactive sessions to contribute questions or thoughts about our topic. This is an interactive forum. Let's get started. Uh, chronophiles, data mining your life for comprehensive thinking. This topic is based on a short five-page essay, Man with a Chronophile, written in 1967 by Buckminster Fuller, who I call Bucky for short. The essay is important context and its ideas will be both the background and the foreground for my remarks. But I will try to give enough of the context so that everyone can follow, even if you did not read the essay. Okay, to, to start, we're gonna look at a chronophile to document your life as a case history. In Buckminster Fuller's essay, man with a chronophile. He tells the story of his realizations gained from his childhood art of collecting things. This childhood collection grew throughout his nearly 88 years to more than 1,400 linear feet of material which are now housed as the R. Buckminster Fuller Collection at Stanford University. The essay tells a story about what Bucky learned from his collection. In his 1981 book, Critical Path, he slightly expanded the discussion in the uh, 67 essay, quote, in 1907, I started a chronological record of my life, and in 1917, named it The Chronophile. In 1917, at the age of 22, fortified with the already thick chronophile, I determined to make myself the special case guinea pig study in a lifelong research project that is documenting the life of an individual born in the gay 90s, 1895, the year automobiles were introduced, the wireless telegraph and the automatic screw machine were invented and the x-rays were discovered. What I find most interesting about Bucky's idea of a chronophile in this essay is how he suggests that it was through consulting his archive with all its newspaper and magazine clippings, notes and letters, miscellaneous bills and so forth, 
that he was able to glimpse planetary patterns emerging during his lifetime. He talks about two of them in the essay. Between the lines, I read Bucky telling us that compiling a chronophile of your life provides the observational data needed to see how the world works. Could your understanding of the world be facilitated by curating a chronophile of your life history? In the first sentence of Dante's La Vita Nuova, he mentions the book of memory. Is one's book of memory a rudimentary form of a chronophile? Is supplementing our book of memory with curated records and artifacts an important tool for determining how the world works? Whether we document our lives in an archive, a diary, a collection of posts or videos on a blog or a vlog, in the 52 Living Ideas video archives, in the collections of your email, computer files, and social media timelines, or strictly in your book of memory, each of us constructs or designs the case history of our life in relation to our world. We choose what to remember, what to forget, what to collect, how to organize it, and what to make of it all. We can think of our chronophile as our book of memory enhanced with documents and artifacts, however it is built and maintained. By conscientiously curating our archives and preserving them for future review and study, our chronophile records can help us evaluate hypotheses, imagine new hypotheses, inform our explorations into how the world works. For Bucky, the result was guinea pig B, one of the most thoroughly documented lives in history. For you, the result can be a new way to practice comprehensive thinking. Guinea pig you. Bucky's essay suggests that his visionary insights may have been empowered to a significant degree by his record keeping and record reviewing. Perhaps his perspicacity for understanding the world was the result of his carefully curated enhancement to his book of memory, his, in his curated chronophile. A chronophile is a tool for understanding our lives because the planning and judgment that goes into building and maintaining and reviewing a record of your life gives us a new way to view our lives to help us better see how we intersect with the world. We might learn how we repeatedly make the same mistakes. We might learn the patterns that drive our successes. We might remember all the alternative paths that might have been. We might glean the design approach that we have been using to shape our lives. We might imagine how we can improve the design of our life and how we can track our progress achieving these objectives through our future chronophile records. A chronophile is also a tool for understanding the world. Each of us needs to understand the world we are thrown into by birth. 
Is this the era of sticks and stones? When humans roll megaliths into place by raw labor, the era of swords and war chariots, horse-drawn carriages, the steam engine, wired transitioning to wireless, aeronautics, digital technologies, or maybe this is the era of the electric bicycle. What kind of human being will you and I need to be in order to be successful in this era of human history? As we gather intelligence about the traditions that are available to us in today's world, we might choose to invest more or less time learning, for example, the art of napping quartz, flint, or other fine stone cores to make tools. By the way, the stone tool tradition is still producing artifacts for the global market. It's been three million years in counting. Even if you only maintain your chronophile in an ad hoc fashion, and entirely in your head, you are recording the cultural accoutrements and traditions that shape your life as it intersects your world. Some might object to collecting materials for a chronophile because maybe most things are best forgotten. Maybe you believe out with the old in with the new and never look back. Sometimes we hear the advice, live in the moment, to be free of our life history. In an exquisite 2007 article in the New Yorker on the Pidahan people of the Amazon, we learn of a culture that disdains history and really does live in the moment. But even the Pidahan carefully curate their book of memory. They talk about current events, but their curatorial values are on the opposite end of the spectrum from Bucky, who collected vast amounts of materials over decades to document his whole life and its intersection with world history. Each person can decide how to curate their chronophile to better organize their comprehensive thinking and their comprehensive learning. You might model your chronophile on the Padahan. Being oblivious to history might have its advantages. Everyone gets to design their own approach to comprehensive learning. The evidence from Buckminster Fuller's case history from his chronophile suggests that chronophiles with extensively collected materials can be a powerful tool to better understand your life and your world. It may be that our complex civilization needs more citizens who can more broadly learn from their archive enhanced case histories than what an ad hoc living in the moment attitude might muster. Okay, to explore chronophiles further, uh, Joe, let's uh, break out into small groups for 20 minutes. You have some rules for that? Yes, I do. Um, uh, folks, we're going to break out into rooms for 20 minutes. Uh, I'm going to make it at around six, six individuals per room. Please give everybody an opportunity to speak and come back with your best questions for CJ and we'll, we'll go through the questions together as a group. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, CJ? 
Uh, the subject of this first segment was chronophiles, the book of memory, organizing your life history as a source of observational data for comprehensive learning. So it would be best if everyone could share their thoughts. If you have any questions, uh, share them with your breakout group and maybe someone can help you refine the question or maybe even hint at some partial answer. And then we can come back and in the whole group, um, go into remaining questions in, in some depth. Uh, uh, so the breakout is a chance for each person to share where they are in processing this so that each other, each of you can help each other make sure you understand it as well as you can in 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Okay. Folks, I'm opening the breakout rooms now. Almost, okay. Uh, I think we have a couple participants, unless a couple people had dropped off. Um, yeah, I think we're all back. Okay, folks, now it's time for questions. Please type exclamation point uh if you would like to ask a question uh cj would you actually like to pose your questions to the group first or would you like to wait yeah why don't why don't i start the q a we want to hear your questions in my breakout there was a very interesting discussion and some of the participants might want to focus what they learned from that into a question and in your breakout maybe you had a question or maybe your question wasn't brought up in the breakout you want to to start the ball rolling i have two questions that i want to put we're going to collect a list of questions joe and i all of your questions we might not get to all of them in this first segment we're going to focus on questions about chronophiles the book of memory organizing your life history as a source of observational data for comprehensive learning. And then there's a second segment and a third segment. And some of these questions we might save for one of the later segments. But we want to get everyone's questions on the table right now. My first question, what value might supplementing your book of memory, that was this expression from Dante Alighieri's um, poem written in 1294, that you have a book of memory. And if you supplement your book of memory with thoughtfully curated chronophile, your own records, however you might do it, and I left it very open to interpretation how you might collect a chronophile, to bring your understand to to uh, supplement your understanding of the world and how it works. So, what value might form organizing a chronophile have? And my second question is, what documents and artifacts, if added to your chronophile, might help you better mine your life history for comprehensive learning? So those, those were the main questions that I, I wanted to see where people are based on the provocation that was my, my uh, remarks earlier. Joe, does anyone else have a question? So uh, right now we have Sarah. Do you wish to unmute and ask your question? If not, she asks, could we construct a system to have a better insight from a chronophile? No other questions? And I'm going to put CJ's um, questions in the chat. Uh, and we can kind of, OK, so we have one from uh, Jeff and one from Maritza. Go ahead. Jeff. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. 
Are you, or can you not unmute? Maybe that was in a help hurting Sarah as well. If I don't know, can they unmute? Um, hang on one second. I have to go to the participants. There we go. That could have been an issue. <laughs> Sorry. There we, there. Go. there we go. Sorry about that. No worries. So um, the, the concise way for me to ask this question are what are the questions that you want to ask once you have the data in order to decide what to learn from your experience because my experience is that from virtually every experience i've ever had i could choose to learn a variety of different things from that experience, you know, like generically, I might, I might learn that was a real mistake and I should never do that or anything like it ever again. Um, or I could learn, you know, I still like what I what the experience or the benefit I was trying to get from what I tried there or what I did. I wonder if there's another way I could get it, you know, or you know, I, I was trying to get something there and I realized um, even though I didn't get it, that's not really what I want. And I could, I could change what I want based upon that experience. So there's just generically and then even particularly, there are a variety of different things that one might learn from any experience. And it might be intriguing to craft some, some, uh, some reasonable um, almost default basic inquiry regarding experience in order to learn the best things from it, whatever we think, um, however we might characterize what the best things could be. Perfect. Okay, uh, I think I've got it. Do you have a good summary, Joe? Yeah, I, basically, I have it as what are the questions that you can ask to learn from your experiences from your chrono file? That's how I've kind of summarized it. Okay. And um, maybe I would just, I would add to that, Joe, to sure. learn the best things from your experiences. To learn the best things. Yeah. Because because that, that begs the question, well, what do we think is, what, what do we think might be best? Right, our value system in that framework. So, so Joe, you want to invite Sarah to ask her question again? Yes, yeah, Sarah, would you like to ask your question again? Uh, since uh, I had a little problem with the mute -ish, uh, button there. Yes. Sure. And uh, Sarah, there's a question about the that we could use uh, for those things that we hold on to, well, for the chrono file. CJ, did you get that? Or... Yeah, is there a system for curating a chrono file? Yep. So it's also in the chat if you should need it. Um, and so next we have Maritza followed by Mike. So based on the chatter in uh, my breakout room, I find myself wondering about a check. What, how do we, or do we need some type of a check system in place to help us determine whether or not we've, we're spending too much time on our chronophile? Like, are we going to miss on the growth and the moments because we're too concerned about the chronophile. Okay, so how do we spend, how do we know we're spending too much time on our chronophile? Yeah, 
Yeah, that that's great. You could you could end up spending all your time on your chronophile and not have a life other than in your chronophile. That would be that would probably be too much. Yeah, you'd miss your point. So, um, and next we have Mike, and then I believe uh, Sanjay, and then I think Laura asks for a quick definition of integrity, if you could. Yeah, that, that's let's do that for second segment. I, I okay. definitely want to get to that, but after the second segment. Okay. Some of these questions we might answer in the second segment as well, folks. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mike. Mike, go ahead. What's your question? Uh, life is an experiment. If you're going to conduct an experiment, you have to decide what data you're going to save and how you're going to organize it. Uh, sometimes you're going to do uh, you're going to uh, observe an event that only lasts for 120 nanoseconds. Mike, so, your, Mike, your question. What's your question? Uh, how do you organize the data, and how do you decide what data you got, and and then when you got the data, uh, and you're trying to figure out what happened, uh, so what should happen next? Uh, how do you interpolate and ex extrapolate to what that next data is? And uh, how do you use that data? I love it. Thank you. Great. Uh, then we have Sanjay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so my question is is around the um, the central premise that the chronophile will help us to understand how the world works. And what I got out of um, you know man with a chronophile with with um, Buck uh article or essay, he was saying that the chronophile would help him to understand what changed in the world, not necessarily how the world works. Um, so that's one part. And the second part is that if we are either supplementing or selecting what we're placing into our chronophile, aren't we in effect editing our interpretation of things? By filtering what we place into the chronophile, are we modifying what we get out of it? Is our bias impacting our chronophile? Would that be the correct way of summarizing it? Yeah, yeah, I think that okay. that's good. Yeah, but not not so much. But I don't think it's necessarily intentional bias. Right. Sometimes, right. you know, for example, most people they choose to to, to um, keep happy memories, but that is that is a bias. That's right. How do we maintain maybe the integrity of our chronophile? Right, integrity and objectivity. Okay. All right, um, and w I think CJ or Sanjay is uh, the last person with a question. So, CJ, how would you like to approach this? Which question do you think we want to take first here? I yeah, think I, I really think all these questions are coming at, at, at the, the main issue of a chronophile from slightly different language. Um, Sarah's asking about the system for curating or building our chronophile. Jeff wants to know what are the questions that the questions that you ask to build your chronophile are the uh, are the curatorial guidelines. You know, the question leads to you know, the answer to your question is going to say include this or exclude that or whatever. Um, uh, Maritza's question uh, gets at, um, you know, if we, if we go too far into our data collection, you know, does it affect the results? And, and so it, the, to my mind, these are all questions about the curation of a chronophile. Um, Mike is explicitly asking about the organization, organization of the data, data, the interpretation of the data. 
Um, so that 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 breaks into two parts. Maybe we should uh, address that. Um, and and Sanjay is wondering about our objectivity and the integrity of our chronophiles, since we ourselves are creating them. And um, so in order and to make this actually, we have one more question from Ambika. I missed that. So if uh, I could just go ahead and ha have her add her question. Okay. Joe, cancel mine, please, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Now I was going to actually ask CJ how he develops and plans his, what inspires him, because my my sense is um, one would create one based on what is inspiring to one, and what what appeals and and one's own longing and the connections we make. Um, and how different or how is it is it far removed from a memoir or a travel through a country, for example, uh, because all these things weave themselves in anyway, I, as I see it, but please correct me. Yeah, I, uh, I love it, but let me expand it to how do each of us, you know, anyone who cares to contribute, uh, curate their chronophile. I would make the argument that we all curate our chronophiles, even the Padahan. Yeah. They curate it in their book of memory. They don't actually record things. When they build an artifact, they throw it out within two weeks because they want to live in the moment and they don't want to be burdened with, you know, that model airplane I built uh, when the people came in with their airplane. They just throw it away after a few weeks. I would keep it it'd be on the mantelpiece, but you know everyone has their own curatorial guidelines. Um, Joe, Lee, let's, or do, oh, how do you want to approach this? Do you want to crowdsource these questions and just? Uh, yeah, I I want to um, I I want to you know where I got to. Where's mine? Mine is the value and mine is the documents and artifacts. So I, I would, I, I'd like to crowdsource this. I'd like to get everyone's impact on, I think we can put all, all the, all the questions with the exception of Mike's about interpretation and um, Laura's about integrity all these questions relate to how do I curate the chronophile? What questions do I use? What system do I have? How do I make it objective? How do I prevent it from taking over my life? You know, all these questions are about how do you organize a chronophile? And, and, and because, you know, how do you, CJ, or you, Mike, or you, Joe, or you, Maritza, organize your chronophile. Each of us have been collecting some things and tossing out others. And so we all have a chronophile in various states of disorganization, minds especially disorganized. And, and how would everyone address these questions? Um, what piece of the puzzle do you see that you can share? So folks, uh, line up to answer how you would, again, how you would organize your chronophile is essentially, or and how would you curate your chronophile? Is that, a, is it? Yeah, okay. yeah. So um, uh, Ambika, and then I see Lee has her hand up as well, Ambika. So I'm in this very interesting process of having quit my job to clearing my boxes, looking for things wanting to pack and discovering things I'd forgotten. And I have two boxes of journals from when I was in high school and first college. And it's very interesting to see the things I was writing then. And when I started teaching, everything went down because you don't have time to develop your own writing and your own thinking. It was just, I wrote that. Wow, I wrote that. But our writing takes different turns because I've been writing and publishing poetry since then. But, but I open another box and 
what I thought I was going to be my life's work, the whole idea of Prometheus is sitting there I'm like, damn it, where did I go? What happened? So I'm not putting them in different piles so that when I move from here, which I want to do, which is why I'm in and out of boxes, that I can start doing my new work. And this includes my paintings. I just bought all these boxes today and I have not cataloged anything. And it's, it's very challenging to do all these single-handed yeah. and pack at the same time and you know, what's next. So uh, how do you organize your work? That's really your own thing. Some, no one can tell you how to organize your work. It's what you resonate with. You want to look at your poems? Here they are. You want to look at your stories? You want to look at what you created, what you dreamt about? Because time is fluid. Even though there is a linearity, time is also fluid. And we see that in our dreams. And I don't think there is only one way to organize a chronophile unless you want to be absolutely chronological, then that then you have it. But if you want to go back and forth because connections do arise, then you discover something new. I think it's really your own creative process. And what what you know, the an idea that you loved 10 years ago, you may be indifferent to it now. It still has a place there. But maybe you discover something new and wow, that comes back to life. So it's, it's, yeah, I don't think we can be so mental about it, but we just need to tune in and connect. And I think Foster said only connect, but, but I think it's just, it's just such a lovely process. I mean, we are thinking about all these things while taking a walk, you know, then and now and this, the partition, what mom said. And how would I do this differently? That's where I am right now. So this is very interesting. But, you know, the process is your own. No one can tell you how to do it as, as I see it. I can see guidance, say, okay, now, CJ, I've done this. How do I get out of this muddle, you know? That's another creative solution. Come, you know, that, thank you. I just wanted to share this. That's, that's lovely. I, I want to interject. Bucky emphasized that he had a chronological record, but he also felt the need to have some things in subject files. So he wasn't as religious as the name chronophile suggests about putting it in chronological order. And, and me personally, doing it strictly chronological, I mean, my God, I'd have to correlate my email files with the um, photocopies of my sent letters with, you know, you know, it just can't be done in one linear chronological record mm -hmm. unless you're fastidious to all get out and don't want to have a life uh beyond organizing your chronophile maritza's concern yeah maritza actually wants to respond uh and then uh, well, lee has her hand up lee and then lee uh, actually so uh, let's let lee go uh, maritza then mike actually and i have an interesting response too uh okay um i you use the to to the quantifier about the um, I recording all the um, the um, comedy shows, you know, um, a, a, a lot. Mary Tyler Moore, uh, uh, I love Lucy, and um, Saturday Night Night. I usually record the, the one is more 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 fun. I mean, more funny, you know, and so easy to. Um, I re I recorded it and I listened to 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 it. You know, I I that time I believe that I can understand American society. You know, but then I find that um, my qualify. You know, because all those those um, and I I I could learn about. 10 years, you know, so, you know, even now they don't have the, the, the recorded tape, you know, those kind of uh, tape, you know, so I, I, I feel like, I feel like, 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 like I even um, connect so, so much, listen to much, so much, but when I go outside, oh, 
it's totally different world, world, you know. So I think I'd say, okay, this is only the drama. <laughs> I I love that. Um, the idea of the way we curate our entertainment records, those things that we want in our entertainment archive. And then you go back and look at them and realize how quaint and 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 oh you know that's one way to learn how the society's changed in the culture I, I i think that's a wonderful illustration thank you so uh maritza is next and followed by i believe mike then laura um for me you know listening to cj and listen to ambika what came to mind for me is uh, the idea that so i I empathize with the idea of doing it in strict chronological order is a near impossibility. Um, but something that I've always done is I, I put dates on everything. I mean, I actually have leaves that I've picked that have dates. So I can remember when I picked the leaf, right? Well, okay, if, if I'm looking to identify trees, sorry. Uh, but um, I find that I get a little bit I used to get a little annoyed. Now I just write the date on it myself. But I would get a little annoyed, like if somebody gave me a birthday card and there's no date on the birthday card. I'm like, well, I'm not overly prone to saving birthday cards, but if I were, would I not want to know the date in which it was received? And I guess if you really think about it, you just need the year because I mean, my birth date happens the same time every year. But um, it's something you you guys said, each of you triggered for me this the thought that I guess in my way, that's that's my my little bit of order in everything else being very disorganized in my chrono filing, as it were, because I write, um, you know, sometimes I write poetry, sometimes I do journaling, and I use all kinds of mediums. Like if I if I I'm sitting in a park and I think that I uh, I'm thinking upon an experience in my life that I want to record. I'll use, um, you know, whatever, the computer or my phone. But if I'm home, I'd prefer to grab a book and paper. And sometimes it's scraps of paper and it's in all random places. But I find that for everything I do, there's like always a date scribbled on it. And so any random things that you'll see, like if I save a train ticket or if I save a concert or um, I like to save um, a, a play books, I'll put the date that I attended the play on it. Um, and and it, that, that makes me sound like I have this giant file of random crap that I save. I, I really don't, I promise. But the few things that I do save, I, I put a date on them. And uh, I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling, but I just wanted to share that. No, thank you for your sharing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mike, uh, then Laura, then Ambika. Well, uh, I'd like to go down this rabbit hole of trying to say that life is an experiment and how you instrument that experiment to gather data. And then what do you do uh, uh, to gather that data? And, how, and then you find that it doesn't, you didn't gather the right data. And how do you extrapolate uh, to related data? Or how would you provide, the, how would you perform the next experiment? Uh, if you visit uh, Jimmy Carter's library uh, in uh, Atlanta, you find that a lot of stuff is indexed. But uh, for, if you want to try and find out why he did certain things during the hostage crisis in Iran, uh, you're probably going to not be able to find it. And that's relevant to how you what happens with the hostage crisis that's developing in Afghanistan. So uh, you can't, uh, so uh, you, you, it's, it's a situation where the data is not there, but you kind of make the best of the data you got. And if you don't throw data away, but try and organize it and index it. And you can't index it until you have the problem in mind that you're trying to solve of today's world. So uh, the uh, uh, best way to index it is to index everything. Uh, uh, have a network database, uh, ha uh, or uh, or um, do something that uh, uh, that everything is tied together. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, until you do that, just uh, organize everything by date. And uh, so I, uh, uh, the events in my life uh, that have worked, I've got uh, journals, I've got calendars, uh, and they're indexed in chronological order. And when I want to try and uh, find something, it's an experiment to go in and create a, an ad hoc meta index that, of what I've got. And uh, it may be that I don't have what I need, and I got to go interview some of the other participants in uh, that experiment to try and get where I want to be. What? So you, you, you never so, have enough data, and you never have it organized enough, but uh, you, uh, you need to uh, keep enough that you can uh, do those experiments and those uh, those thinking games, uh, those thought experiments. So I think Mike brings up a very important point here, and actually I'd like to get your thoughts on this, CJ, really briefly, is that you know what's noted in the, the Buckminster Fuller article, and I mentioned this in our breakout room, is this idea of where he captured the distance between Cambridge and Boston and the decrease in time in a train. And one of the reasons that caught my eye is because lag and the relationship with time is such an important value in a lot of the things that he assesses. So I think a thing that we can kind of come to here is to really, what are the values that we're looking for? That's Bucky Fuller actually knew what he wanted stability, economics. He looked at everything across the board. He really actually, he had an idea of what he was chronologically you know what he was capturing in his data so that he could counter, counter some Malthusian type of thinking that would uh, you know that that would show how, how you know life was going to be in 20 30 40 years but he had a value system so he wasn't caught up in the data I think that's a really important point and Mike's talking about that and it gets to Jeff's question as well how do we get to the best questions and I think it is it's through a value system. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I think your value system affects your curation. I mean, I gave the example of Bucky as this, you know, over the top collector and the Padahan is a people that, you know, throw everything out that's older than two weeks because why would that matter in today's world? We only care about this moment. Um, and and I think that's what we're hearing from Maritza and Ambika and everyone who's spoken in all their questions is that, you know, Sarah was looking for a system. The system is what value system you want to bring to your collection. And what I what what Mike triggered in me was the thought that as you practice organizing your archive in whatever form you're organizing it, whether it's leaves on the shelf, dated or um, train ticket records, and you happen to notice when you review them, hey, you know, when I went with my father when I was 10 years old, it was two hours by horseback, and now it's 20 minutes by train, something's happening in the world I'm living in that, you know, Bucky was living in a special time, as he pointed out, between 1895, we went from horseback to a hundred years later, no, no, uh, 74 years later, we're on the moon. I, I mean, something dramatic happened in Buckminster Fuller's lifetime going from horseback to, you know, NASA travel through space. It, it was an incredible period of time. And, and other people talked about it, of course, other people noticed, but Bucky had his chronophile so he could record it. I'm sorry, I, I missed the point I was trying to get to from Mike's. What Mike inspired in me was the thought that as you wrestle over time, with your collection, your curatorial values may change. You may suddenly realize, why have I been throwing out my birthday cards? 
you may suddenly realize, why have I been keeping my birthday cards? <laughs> you know? um, your curatorial values may change. And, you know, I wish I knew the answer to Sarah and Sanjay's and Mike's and Jeff's questions. What? All we can do, I think, is talk among ourselves and try to develop the art of chronophile record. You know, what surprises me about this topic is that there isn't a course in university, how to maintain your life's archives, that ye decades of practice from art historians, um, museum curators can come in and inform us, most of us, get our curatorial practice from our parents or you know maybe we keep a diary or a journal or something but it's it's happenstance and we don't talk about what are the options and and what value might come from someone like buckminster fuller who really gathered from a, a wide variety of sources data that he collected and integrated that over the, his lifetime started producing insights. And yeah, and so Laura wants to get in then Ambika, we're running a little bit short on time. So I, I do wanna just, if you keep your comments very short, um, but I do think we'll get to this in the next segment when we talk about principles, if, if that's where you're going, I'm assuming you are. Um, and if we get to principles, I think we could start to hash out how the curation process works, even how to what, look to to uh, eliminate some bias in that. But Laura, then Ambika, but briefly, so that we could uh, um, then get to the next segment. Laura, you have to unmute. Yeah, don't forget there are people who do library sciences who could help you a great deal in this process of, of all the things that you're talking about. And I'm sure you could hire students who would be very happy to help you, you know, put together any kind of chronologies and, you know, indexes and things that you could go on a computer and find all the information you want, you know. So I think that all could be done in that, you know, if you're willing to pay somebody to help you out. But I think library sciences could be very helpful in that in that arena. So I think there are courses available for what you're talking about. And now I've suddenly forgotten my thing because I laughed so hard when Maritza made her comments um, that I think mine slipped away. But um, yeah, <laughs> honestly, it did. So I'll just drop it for them. Thank you for the library sciences. Yes, and um, and Bika and George. So I uh, wanted to share that, you know, we, we, you were talking about values, but our values can change. Mm -hmm. And it's a good idea that they do change, you know, because we may be sometimes hitting out in the dark. So, so that way, and uh, uh, would you also consider a, um, a story of travel with, with poets, poetry and stories uh, woven in as a chronophile? And uh, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Danger about to say. But yeah. thank you. so thank you. Uh, um would you actually uh consider it like would that be part of your chronophile, CJ, or just out of curiosity? Um I I don't I don't have that many of those kinds of documents. Uh but maybe I should, um, you, you know, it's, I, I, I really think my chronophile has not been curated as well as it could be. It, it's very hard. You can, you can spend an infinite amount of time and, and my problem has been, um, I keep thinking of ways of doing it that I don't have the time or money for. And, and so then I just throw up my hands and say, you know, let me put my nose to the grindstone and, and, and then I don't have the records I need. But I, I would say that to a significant degree, 
my success in organizing this series of topics is because I have a chronological list of all the meetup topics I've organized for the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society, the Math Counts Group, 52 Living Ideas, they're all integrated in one file that goes from the oldest to the newest and, and carries on to the next five years of projected topics that I want to do that I'm continually reorganizing. And that tool has been very effective for me in organizing a lot of my thinking. So I, I do think that whatever you keep as a archive will significantly strengthen your capabilities, abilities, and understanding. But if you keep different things, you're just going to have smarts in different areas than I am. And isn't it so wonderful that we have so many different kinds of people and we're not all the same. So, mm -hmm. so just organize it the best you can. So we're going to go to George and then we're going to go to the next segment because we're running way, way behind. So George. Yeah. I had just a quick point relating to CJ's question about uh, academic resources and I forget her name mentioned libraries. In particular, the Library of Congress has pages about helping ordinary people to organize what's called their personal archive. That is a term of art that they use rather than the more poetic chronophile. I just wanted to put that out there, that there are all kinds of resources available to help ordinary people, you know, just organize. They've got photographs and physical media like leaves or photos or theater ticket stubs and so forth. And there are tools out there to help one learn to just incrementally catalog and organize and create something more structured out of what you already have. That, thank that's, you. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, okay, uh, the second segment, I'm going to go a little bit into another trajectory and talk about the omni integrity of universe. Um, the connection is what more can we learn from Bucky's chronophile essay, the short five page essay that I linked to in the event description and in my essay uh, that, that surveyed this subject. Near the end of Bucky's essay, he reminds us of his definition for universe the cumulative aggregate of all humanity's non-simultaneous experiences. We explored that notion of universe last October in the mm -hmm. event on the comprehensive right. thinking of our Buckminster Fuller. This definition of universe places everyone's experiences broadly considered as the concrete reality of universe as the basis for all our thinking. Bucky goes on to assert a quote, which I'm gonna talk a lot about it and it's complicated. So I'm going to uh, share my screen here. And, uh, oh darn. Uh, before I can share the screen, I have to, I have to find the window. And there it is. Okay. Now let's hope this works. It doesn't. Uh, uh, I'm going to um, try again. Uh, CJ, I think it CJ, just did. I think it just did. 
There you go. There you go. Right. Um... Okay. Um... This quote, let me read it. It's a mouthful, it's a mindful, but we're going to break it down and we're going to make it understandable. The omni interactive, weightless, generalized principles apparently governing universe, which are discovered only experimentally and progressively by human intellect directed science, these generalized principles disclose an a priori, anticipatory, amorphous, and only intellectually conceivable omni-integrity of universe. Can we make sense of this? What does it say about our efforts for comprehensive inquiry and action to better understand and participate in the world? In the event in June, on redressing the crises of ignorance, we learned that the generalized principles are patterns that govern many different special cases. They can be identified by reviewing vast inventories of experience of universe to find patterns that might have broad applicability. We saw the failure to conscientiously and comprehensively review humanity's vast inventories of experiences to distill out the most effective generalized principles as a crisis of ignorance. Because our chronophiles confront us with the records of our experiences, they can help us redress this crisis. In reviewing our chronophiles, we may identify new generalized principles. In studying our chronophiles, we can look for experiences that support or contradict a hypothesized generalized principle. To make further sense of Bucky's quote, Let's start with the object at the end of it, namely the omni-integrity of universe. Can I highlight that? Um, no, I, I'm using the wrong image viewing software for highlighting. Um, uh, so the prefix omni Omni-integrity of universe means all. Creatively interpreting Wiktionary's entry for it, the word integrity, I discovered that it means adherence, wholeness, and completeness. It's one way of thinking of integrity. In the event in August on shifting perspectives and representing the truth, I define truth as the coherence of a perspective or hypothesis with those experiences and beliefs that justify it. With some creative inspiration, we might interpret Bucky's omni-integrity to be an adherence to all the truths of all the generalized principles in all humanity's experiences considered from all perspectives as a complete whole. But wait, maybe there is a fundamental incoherence in all our experiences. If our experiences were incoherent, things would be unpredictable. There may be no patterns. There may be no principles, no truths. Maybe we live in such a world and we delude ourselves that learning is even possible. But then we look at the principles of reflection and refraction of light as disclosed by Ibn al-Haytham. We learn, look at the principle of gravitation and many others, and we are struck by overwhelming evidence that there are reliable, 
generalized principles. So maybe there is a coherence and integrity. Is there an omni integrity or is it just a, a small integrity? Um, our, our civilization is so complex that sometimes we all experience feelings of fragmentation, incoherence, and incomprehensibility. Incomprehensibility. We may wonder if the allure of an integrity of universe, of a coherence of universe might be illusory. The event last December on the value of multiple working hypotheses suggested that we ought to organize several hypotheses to better assess our questions. This question we're developing here is the root of any science, of any knowing. Is there any integrity, any coherence at all for our minds, for our intellectual efforts? Is the universe knowable or not? Here are three possible hypotheses. First, the world may have complete omni-integrity so that the universe is an immaculate design organized by always reliable generalized principles. This is Bucky's hypothesis. It is also the assumption of most academic science and even some theology. But a second hypothesis we may uh, uh, take is that the integrity of the world is only partial. Principles may always only have limited applicability. They may change whimsically due to some god or gods or a principle like fundamental randomness that interjects itself or fundamental chaos. This hypothesis, the second hypothesis, gives us a world of miracles. It's the occult world of magic, or it's the world of God playing dice, like in some popular interpretations of quantum mechanics. This view is favored by some academic scientists and some theology. A third hypothesis is that the world may have no integrity, no coherence at all, and is therefore fundamentally incomprehensible. All learning is a delusion and nothing meaningful exists. This hypothesis are, refers to the various variations of nihilism. Each of these hypotheses and the many variations on them forms a basic assumption about the nature of our world, which we may influence, which may influence our approach to learning, to assess whether the world is fully, partially, or negligibly governed by generalized principles, we can consult our chronophiles. Which of these hypotheses best agrees with your life history. How often and how reliable are the generalized principles that apply in your chronophile? What assessment does your book of memory render? To evaluate these hypotheses, it seems we first need to identify proposed generalized principles, and then we need to assess their reliability. This assessment would also be important for identifying the limits to our current knowing. We called this minding the gap with our mistake mystique, which was the first crisis of ignorance examined in the June event on redressing the crises of ignorance. Ultimately, these analyses may indicate the degree to which there may be limits on the integrity operative in universe. Now, to get back to this Bucky quote, 
let's consider how Bucky's adjectives clarify his thinking about the nature of the generalized principles, which he says are omni-interacting and weightless. Principles are always conceptual, and so they're weightless. Moreover, principles all interact with each other. In his book, Synergetics, Bucky called them omni interaccommodative suggesting that they coordinate cooperatively so that all contribute. And that suggests that they are non-contradictory. One exception disqualifies a generalized principle, though in most cases one can simply add a caveat to make it again an omni interaccommodative generalized principle. Bucky uses more adjectives to clarify his thinking about omni integrity. He says a priori, anticipatory, amorphous, and only intellectually conceivable. The Latin phrase a priori means presumed without analysis, or presumed by hypothesis. To avoid a logical regress, every system of thinking must begin with assumptions, which some writers designate a priori. Bucky sidestepped our multiple hypotheses analysis by simply asserting an a priori omni-integrity. Anticipatory suggests that the omni-integrity operates with full awareness of the effects of all the generalized principles. Amorphous suggests that as the generalized principles are progressively accumulating, they never form a fixed structure. Finally, intellectually conceivable observes that the omni-integrity, like the generalized principles, is conceptual and so not physical. Putting all this together, we might summarize. The presumed omni-integrity of universe is the hypothesis that the continual accrual of humanity's ever-expanding inventory of experiences adhere and cohere to all the truths of all the generalized principles considered from all perspectives as a complete whole. Even if Bucky's hypothesized omni-integrity of universe falls short and the knowability of our world is fundamentally limited by randomness, occult magic, intervening gods, or inherent chaos, the idea of an integrity in universe provides the comprehensive explorer with an epistemic virtue, a criteria for good learning with which to assess our inventory of hypothesized generalized principles using your chronophile. This suggests that one of the tasks of comprehensive exploration is to negotiate the nature of the integrity of universe. Is it fully, partially, or negligibly governed by generalized principles. Uh, Joe, do we have time for a 15 minute breakout or? Uh, I, think uh, I think we should probably do it just 10 just minutes. 10 minutes. Uh, uh, I think 15, I think 15 might, be little, might be a little hurt. hurt. Okay. So in a 10 minute breakout, let's explore the omni integrity of universe in small groups. The main ideas here was, is there an omni-integrity operative in universe? 
or is the integrity of our universe partial, illusory, or non-existent? And how can our chronophiles help us answer this question? Okay, so okay. I'm going to start the breakout rooms now. Actually, okay. Um, so would you like to post your final question to the group and then uh, we'll crowdsource yeah. some answers and then or do you want to take any well, final questions or take some of the but, questions that we received before that? Yeah, I want to, I definitely want to do Laura's question from before. Um, we don't really have time. Well, maybe, maybe we have. Why don't let, we let's, take... start, let's start with uh, Laura's question. Why this definition of integrity? And uh, the, the reason was I, I decided to base this topic on Bucky's essay, Man with Chronophile. And he talks about the chronophiles, and I said, what other important aspect of this article that Bucky wrote um, would help us with comprehensive learning? And I decided that this definition of omni-integrity um, uh, helps us think about some aspects of comprehensive thinking, big picture thinking, that, you know, frankly, what I was thinking is next month I'm trying to write and, and uh, organize a topic on Dante's Commedia, um, his magnum opus from 700 years ago. And I wanted to sort of broach this subject of the integrity uh, or omni-integrity of universe. And so I wanted to get these ideas on our table to explore. They're, they're a little subtle. And in, in my group, um, I, I, think, I think we made some progress, but it, it, it's, it's a challenging subject. Um, and, and maybe it needs a uh, more meetups, but we're going to do our best tonight. Um, you know, given, given the time, let's, uh, crowdsource the answer for, um, my question. I have one question for everyone. And if you have an answer to this question, uh, type exclamation point or, um, or raise your hand, right, in Zoom. Uh, my question is, do you find any evidence in your chronophile, in your uh, record-enhanced book of memory for or against an omni-integrity, uh, you know, this sort of coherence, this sort of omnipresent collection of generalized principles. Um, uh, is that something that you find evidence for or evidence against in your chronophile? Um, and, and so let's see where people are thinking about this. Um, okay, Joe. Okay, so I put the question in the chat. Uh, so everyone, anybody has an answer to CJ's question, uh, type exclamation point. Uh, Okay, it doesn't seem like we have any takers. Oh, okay. Oh, Ambika, thank you. I'm supposed to have left, but no, <laughs> only the idea of our interconnectedness that always shows up. It seems to be a thread in my work. So you find evidence for it. Um, I don't know if I've looked for evidence, but it feels like it's all around. 
<laughs> yes, maybe maybe also where I grew up, and and of course the poetry. It's the poetry. That does it make it to an omni integrity? Is it all integrated, or is it just some sense of maybe to some degree? I don't know how to measure some degree, but it feels like we are all interconnected. You know, stock market falls here; it affects the rest of the world. Look what COVID has done. Um, but but beyond all of this the sensibility of the human heart and the human soul. And when we look at poetry, there are all these connections, no matter where you come from. The transcendentalists, the in Indian poetry, the romantics, I mean, everybody who connects with nature, for instance, speaks that way about nature. And so we are part of it. Unfortunately, we've separated ourselves terribly and have created illness and instead of our wholeness. So yes, there is, this is the evidence. And I, I, I may also share that a, a lot of people were so excited about gathering and writing anthologies about COVID and, and it was too soon. How could you just straight away start talking about all the bad things? It's not a good thing, but, but I think last year people didn't know as much as they know now. Uh, so, uh, so the, so some of those things, yes. Well, what a great question, CJ. Thank you. Evidence. <laughs> See, when people smile, that is evidence. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ambika. Uh, then we have Maritza followed up by Kevin. Um, I see evidence both for and against uh, CJ. I don't think it's either or. The, um, the idea of, it's all the, all, the word awe used so many times in the definition when we're looking at the omni-integrity of the universe, it gives me a little pause because it, it seems to demand such a strict um, adherence. It seems like it would be setting me up for a failure if I were looking at my um, chrono file enhanced book of memory, could I say with certainty that I was in fact recording with full integrity? We all have biases, you know, we, we are, we're human, we're all fallible. So is it, is there some room in this definition for a good faith effort, as it were, um, in, uh, in my discussion that we just had, we, we they brought up the word, and, and Joe's probably sick of hearing me use this word by now. Sorry, Joe. It's intentionality. The, the importance of intentionality would be my um, vote for where I see the evidence for this definition, is if we, if we answer our question of, is there room for you know, honest faith effort by looking at it and saying, well, that do you approach everything with intentionality, the intention to be you know, in adherence to all the truths of all the generalized principles in all humanity's experience, right? If, if we're approaching that with intention, then I, I think that's the evidence that one can use and shine a spotlight on or because if not, then we may fall prey to our own and our society's biases. And th there will be no wholeness that way if we don't, if we're not aware of it. Great, thank you. Is there, let me see if there's anybody else. Um, I don't have anybody else, CJ. We have Kevin Ramirez. Oh yeah, sorry, for, sorry about that. Yeah, yes, it's okay. Time. You know, um, uh, like that word talking in the in the in the chat. Um, if uh, I guess in a way to let go of everything that we record, in a way it could be described as attachment. You know, in a more spiritual sense, um, especially you know everything that's you know dear to us or traumatizing to us, especially that's the ones that we I guess like to 
get rid of. So we can, um, but that, but again, you know, Buckley would state that, well, I guess with the uh, defects also of society, you can you get to have a, a view and, and make a point and, and try to change that defect into a, a positive. But um, I guess, you know, to be in that level, um, it, it's in a way to also let go of one's ego and, and all this uh, other uh, aspects of ourselves that keeps us from, um, you know, advancing. Um, but, you know, to me, it's like uh, everything um, that, I, I mean, in a way, it, for him, it happened to be a positive uh, outcome. Uh, but it could also, and this is something that Mike has said before, which I also brought it up in the chat, that, um, you know, how, how, how do you determine if you're, actually uh, recording what's true if again if you have a problem a, def uh, a defect yourself oneself in 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 their uh, uh, cognitive uh, perspective you know so if we're recording something that's not true or wrong how do we make sense how, how do we know if if it's, it has a value if not a uh, a destructive outcome um, so that's it's really a, a hard thing to uh, decide on, but I think like um, the other lady was saying, uh, if we have a collective uh, way of, like right now, for example, this is a collective uh, uh, place for ideas, you know, um, so we throw all, all the rights and wrongs so we can make up a better choice, a better way of thinking, a better way of living. Um, but it's like, I'm pretty sure everybody in this group or many other philosophy groups would say, how come this group is not uh, being, have a, have a, why isn't this lesson being taught around the world? Uh, so, um, but yeah, that's, I, I think it's uh, good. And I think it's like, if you have lived all of your life uh, collecting, uh, maybe try the other way. And a lot of people actually are doing it nowadays, but try the other way. Forget everything that you know, and in a way, reborn yourself. But it's it's I think a back and forth kind of thing. You have to try both. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And then we had George. Thank you, Kevin. Very good comments. Yes, th thank you. I've I've actually gotten more new perspectives out of everybody else's contributions. But I was thinking of the relation to my Omnibook to the extent that I have one. Let's kind of call it a distributed system to put it charitably or a heap to put it less charitably. But in my attempts to look at the omni, the everything, the universe, and see integrity there, I wonder if I'm also as much projecting my chronophile onto the universe as much as looking at the universe and processing that. So, for instance, with my background, I see mathematical patterns everywhere. But when I learn a new piece of math, then I see a new pattern. Even And was that already there and I didn't notice it? Or am I projecting a new pattern? And from some of others' remarks here, I'm now wondering, well, maybe the integrity of the omniverse isn't some kind of mathematical structure. Maybe it's a poetic structure. That, that was pretty much my extent of my thoughts. Uh, I love it. Thank you. Um, oh, okay. Joe, is there anyone else or should we go into segment three? Uh, there's nobody else. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and go into segment three? Okay. Um, that, that was a great workout. Um, uh, for I want just very brief remarks uh, trying to connect chronophiles and integrity in, in our comprehensive exploration. 
the epistemic virtue, the value of integrity, you know, co coherence and, uh, you know, this sort of weaker omni-integrity I've been suggesting here, it, it suggests to me that comprehensive practice ought to strive to attempt a holistic integration of all our experiences and all our hypothesized principles in our private thinking and in our thinking with others. As we review and study our chronophiles, these scientific notebooks for our comprehensive thinking, when we do it alone and we do it with others, new gestalt insights might form, creating meanings that may integrate some or all of our experiences and principles. Integrity as our value for integrating all experiences and principles may be seen as a guide to help us drive our meaning-making process, uh, forming holes of new Gestalt insights. It may also be seen as a guide to forming a whole as the output of our comprehensive explorations. The wholeness in the process and the wholeness in the outputs of our comprehensive practice was the subject of our September event on the whole shebang. The videos are on YouTube if you missed it. It may not be possible to integrate all our experiences and principles with all the other others that we may encounter, but setting integrity as a core epistemic virtue aims our exploration toward a comprehensive understanding of the world and how you and me and everyone else participates in the world. That, I think, is the objective for our comprehensive inquiry and action. Putting your chronophile your document and artifact enhanced book of memory in order can now be seen as a crucial prerequisite for the practice of comprehensive exploration. Um, Joe, I was originally intending on asking a couple of questions we may or may not have time for crowdsourcing these, but let me throw out these questions. And if someone wants to react, you know, we'll decide if we have time. Sure. Um, my first question is, is integrity a necessary epistemic virtue to guide us to better comprehensive thinking? Have I made my argument? And is a chronophile, a, a document and an artifact enhanced book of memory, a prerequisite for exploring the integrities in your inventories of experiences? So folks, anybody that wishes to answer either one of those questions, feel free to type exclamation point uh, in the chat and we can go ahead and try and answer these. Um, Sanjay, thank you. Yeah, let me uh, try to answer both, both of them. And again, this is obviously my um, perspective. So, I mean, as far as integrity, I think that's, that's a um, essential virtue. Um, and I, I'm, I'm assuming that, that what CJ's question is specific to guiding us through our comprehensive domain, um, a comprehensivist uh, 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 way of being. Um, and I think integrity is, is um, I don't know if it's the most important, but it is one of the more important um, aspects. Um, 
the second question, so the way I remember is if, um, if a chronophile is a prerequisite to exploring um, our experiences, is that, is that right? Uh, how has it enhanced your experiences? Is that correct, CJ? That was the question. Uh, yeah, let me, let me put these in chat. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, what evidence do you, have you found that uh, Chronophile has enhanced? Um, um, yeah, is your, it a your book, your book of memory? for exploring the integrities in our inventories of experience. That's, that's okay. how I read it. So, um, I mean, the second question then, I think, so it de really depends on how we form a chronophile and whether it's, you know, the, originally what I, what I asked is whether it's a, uh, an objective collection or whether it's been filtered through time or through our own experiences, um, that will determine whether we can use it to explore the integrities of our um, inventories of experiences. Because obviously, if, if it's not complete, then um, it will not let us, you know, go through the catalog of experiences, because the catalog of experiences will not be full. Um, and also, uh, the, the, to, to me, the, the most important aspect of what we're talking about tonight is the you know, the chronophile is something that unless it's exhaustive, um, it will have limited benefit or, it will, or the benefit it will have will be mostly personal, um, you know, rather than uh, helping us to understand, per personal in the sense of emotionally personal, rather than helping us understand uh, structurally or historically what, what happened in our lives, you know, events in our lives. So I think the most important aspect of the chronophile is it has to be as close to exhaustive as, as one can make it. Mm -hmm. Um Okay, I, I let me let me riff on that a little bit. I, I, I like that. I really appreciate that, uh, Sanjay. Um, as, as to objectivity, as, as I tried to suggest before, I think I, I may not have succeeded in saying this before. My, my view is that it would be wonderful if people who think they can be objective try to organize their chronophile objectively. I, I think if they succeeded in that, we would learn a lot about objectivity. We might learn that it's impossible. We might learn, oh, someone finally figured it out and here's the case history to prove it. And then I would learn a lot. Um, you know, it, it would be wonderful if, if it could be done. But, um, you know, in my value of multiplicity, I, I, would, I would value someone who doesn't care about objectivity, too. They might not come up with as comprehensive a view, but, but actually they might. Because, you know, last month I introduced this crazy um, word synecdoche, which is this figure of speech where the part represents the whole. And, and so synecdoche is sort of a poetic gesture where we can look at a part and refer, suggest, gesture toward the whole, even though we're not being comprehensive about it. So, so I would submit that even uh, ad hoc chronophile might permit someone who failed to be religious and diligent about their chronophile, they may happen across some part and infer the whole from that part 
And because they weren't burdened by having this comprehensive, complete archive of 1,400 linear feet, as in Bucky's case, you know, maybe they were able through some poetic accident to find the right, and they might see more than the rest of us who tried harder. I don't know the right way to uh, do comprehensive inquiry and action. But by discussing it, we can explore a multitude of ways and then people can try it out in their chronophiles and report back to us, hey, I was doing it in an ad hoc way, but look what I came up with. And we might find the best results come from, from some more ad hoc approach. Or, or maybe Sanjay's intuition is right. And, and I personally, you know, seeing Bucky Fuller's success, think that a more... Um, diligent chronophile record, uh, you know, gives insights that, that the poetic wanderer, you know, ephemeralization in the essay. If you read the Bucky's essay, he talks about ephemeralization, this idea that he discovered through reviewing his chronophile that through his lifetime, technology was able to do more and more with less and less time less and less material, less and less energy, so that you might project that if the trend continues, maybe it did, maybe it didn't, we, humanity could do so much with so little as to take care of everyone on the planet with no, almost no energy effort or material at all. And, and that's a paraphrase of one of Bucky's quotes. So, um, you're going to get different comprehensive explorations, different comprehensive insights from different chronophiles. And, and, and that would be my reflection. I think we have several. So, uh, yeah, we do. We have uh, Karina, uh, then uh, Sanjay again, and then George, and then uh, Kevin. Uh, so uh, everybody, actually, if you keep your comments, fairly brief only because it's getting a little bit late so Karina yeah okay yeah I just um so CJ uh touched on um something that I wanted to mention which is but uh, just to put it in my words um I don't think that it is possible to create an objective collection of one's life or to be objective like to actually be objective really at all um and so for me i think like yes the, the benefit would be mainly for me in developing awareness of, of like the patterns in my own life um and uh and also it probably would um reveal you know things that i wasn't aware of um in terms of not just my own patterns, but how, how I interact with the world and like the world, what's going on in the world itself. Um, and I think that is good both for the individual and for the whole. Um, and I think what is important right. is to like, just assume that there's gonna be bias and look for what it might be um, in order to be aware of it. So for myself, I just am gonna, I would just assume imperfection and go from there. Thank you, Karina. I, I want to interject here, Joe. Um, Karina, I think you're right if we define objectivity in the usual American, probably actually all of Europe and, and maybe even Japan, I don't know. Um, the Western world seems to think I've been taught that objectivity is sort of this ability to see the underlying reality from a independent of the observer kind of way. And, and I would agree with you, that's impossible. 
But can I suggest an alternative definition of objectivity, one that I think you might recognize as a legitimate use of the grammar objectivity? Another way to think of objectivity is objectivity is what is my objective? What is my intention? When we look at objectivity from the point of view of my objective, I could design a chronophile with my curatorial values and then that chronophile would object my, would represent my objectivity, my intended objective following these curatorial values for whatever reasons I might have. That would be another way to think of objectivity. Thank you. Then, so we have uh, Sanjay, George, and then Kevin. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little more. I mean, I, so I agree with what what um, CJ, you, and and uh, Karina said earlier. Right. So objectivity is 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 complicated. There are more than one definitions of it, and I, I'm not sure if my definition is more Western or or more Eastern, mm. or somewhere in the middle. But um, to to me, when I was when I made the comment, it was more around. Um, that theoretically objectivity is possible, but most people um, cannot, you know, practically most of us cannot do it. Um, but there is a version of it, which um, is where we basically take anything and everything, any and every piece of information that crosses through our lives, and somehow we have it recorded. Um, and in the digital world, it's a little more easier to do that, though, again, it's, it's, it probably will end up with something as as um, uh, Bucky ended up that, you know, we know that he didn't have every single thing in his life in, in his chronophile, but he had the things that he happened to be able to touch, and then he was able to place them in his chronophile. So um, again, it's it's not about having 100% objectivity. That's pretty much impossible for any real person. And that's also why I had that other version where, you know, based on our emotional experiences. We can have a chronophile that is meaningful to us personally, emotionally, rather than um, providing an objective view of the universe. You know, that's too too difficult. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, with that, we'll go to George and then Kevin. I just wanted to respond to the chronophile having to be intentional and full of integrity and objective and impersonal. The world is actually full of wonderful, unintentional chronophiles. I can think of one example, which is in Philadelphia or in North America and probably in other parts of the world, when they do archaeology, they can find a cistern full of things that people discarded that they considered to be worthless. But now, 100, 200 years later, we can look at that, and that gives us an image into those times that isn't even the objective image that they might have wanted to present to us. Another example I would give which was more intentional would be the Paston letters almost a hundred years of family correspondence from the late Middle Ages. Very personal, very biased in their perspective from being gentry and merchants and so forth. But then hundreds of years later, historians can use this and get a quite different complementary view of those times than from the official intentional chronophiles, the royal histories and so forth. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thanks. Thank you, George. Um, and Kevin. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. 
Uh, sure. You know, uh, about the one question that you had uh, asked um, that um, can it be done uh, when you talk about um, be, be able, being able to be objective uh, and and I, like I said, I had mentioned about that other oh, book about that French, and, I, and I'm sorry for not knowing the, the facts, um, but where he actually let go of everything that he's pretty much let go of the ego. And it's the one thing we all carry pretty much all the time. Uh, but again, in those rare scenarios when you can let go and just be true and state the facts, not without being pretty much again it's like you have to not be yourself to describe yourself uh nobody knows you better than yourself so at that point you let go of all that all, all, all the restrictions that can um not have you uh be you know write the truth and writing the truth for most of us i guess it's what keeps us from doing that i guess in a way but if the if you have a goal uh you to and again to be more of um have a general principle if anything that's the goal for example right so you know integrity for sure is should be one of the main principles of uh of oneself um but again you know we're so caught up with and you know if we're thrown into this world at birth uh into a place where that's not being taught but yet you have to discover it as you get on and on and, and what's and, and just as you get on in life. Um, so we discover that and now we're in this place where, uh, like you were asking, can it be done? Uh, can we let go of our ego that we've been uh, brought up by everything that surrounds us? So even if it's true or false, we have to develop ourselves. And like that Miss Lee, uh, Miss Lee has said about uh, we are ourselves uh, because of our past. Again, it's like starting from scratch. So, yeah, I think it's possible, but it's a sacrifice. That's it. Any comments, CJ? No, that that was good. Um, uh, Joe, do you have any closing thoughts? No, I want to thank everybody for uh, attending this evening. And uh, I think that the most important thing that I take away from this uh, is that uh, having a chronophile and kind of knowing what you're interested in, and a chronophile for me would actually serve as something to, you know, kind of counter conventional wisdom. As you build a, a timeline of, of what you're reading, and what people are saying and your own interpretation of that it may be lent, it may lend itself to bias it may lend itself to uh to mistakes in in your judgment however uh it could also lead to some prove something uh that is that would be uh not necessarily conventional wisdom at the time and I think that that's what Bucky did. I think he really kind of countered Malthusian type of thinking with his own approach. And I find that to be extremely valuable because then you, you start to develop your own narrative. And even if your narrative is wrong, that's quite all right, as long as you're honest about it. So to me, I think a chronophile is an extremely valuable tool um, in developing your own narrative and thinking and seeing where the flaws are in your thinking and seeing maybe where your own bias is so that eventually that you kind of can self-correct and uh, and eventually uh, uh, hopefully come up with a better formula for answering the problems that you're trying to address. So um, that would be, you know, that would be my closing comments with this. I, I think it's been a great meetup. I do want to just do a quick a announcement on upcoming events, though, uh, before we go to close. Or actually, do you do you want to close first, and then I'll go to upcoming events? That that's that's fine. Um, uh, yeah, um, I, 
I had two parts. I, I tried to introduce us to the idea of chronophiles. And when I, when I started putting this together, I, I thought, you know, chronophiles are interesting. But as I wrote this up, I really started to feel just how powerful Bucky's chronophile was. I knew it was important in his narrative, but reading the essay, Man with a Chronophile, and, and thinking about how to present this, I, I really matured in my thinking that, wow, each of us really has a chronophile already of some sort, you know, but it's probably ad hoc and and that if we could be objective in in the this second sense I mentioned by coming by setting ourselves an a task to curate our chronophiles and and you know the values you use for curating your chronophile may change you know, once you do it for a month and think back on it, you'll realize, you know, no, oh, I don't want to do that. Let me do it this way. And, you know, it'll change, but it'll make all the difference. It, it did for Buckminster Fuller. I see how what I've recorded gives me leverage and insight into what I've collected. And what I haven't recorded are these effervescent thoughts I can never catch. So I think it, I think it makes a big difference uh, what, what we can have. And then uh, if you read the whole essay, he has so much. I could have organized this topic in so many ways. And, and uh, you know, I, I, we only have a few hours, so I have to limit it. And in integrity was an issue that I, is very important in Buckminster Fuller's thinking. And I wanted to try to, you know, make a first cut at, at looking at it. Integrity has two meanings, it, 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 more than two probably, but at least two. One is there's the integrity as being true to ourselves true to our, our ideas, true to what we say, true to our word, true to our, our commitments. But from an epistemic point of view, from a learning point of view, let's use the word that more of us can relate to, learning. There's also an integrity of our knowing. Does this piece of evidence fit with the hypothesis that we think is true. Does light refract, refract when it goes from medium of different materials? Um, does light reflect at the angle of incidence? You know, um, are the principles that we think operate in the world um, that form do they, do they cohere? And do they cohere with the other principles that we might also believe? And can we imagine new principles that cohere better than the ones we used last week? So integrity and chronophiles, I, I, you know, kind of show each other as tools that we need for comprehensive exploration. Let me okay. leave it there. And uh, I'll be back next month with uh, thoughts on Dante's Comedia. That's going to be a lot of fun, actually. Lot of fun, actually. Uh, I'm looking, uh, forward, I'm to looking that. forward to that. Yeah. Um, folks, we have some upcoming meetups uh, tomorrow. We have the future of leadership. I'm getting an echo. I don't know why. Um, but uh, tomorrow we have the future of leadership. How can we keep moving forward together with Jeff Nugent? Uh, and that is at 7 p.m. Uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, Friday, we have Flow, 
uh, the flow of thought, the book flow that we're covering, uh, that's part of the series. Uh, chapter seven, work as flow. Uh, then the, the is there is another joint meetup with the Asian philosophies. They're covering neo Confucianism and neo Taoism, and I really hope to be able to make that one. Uh, and that's being hosted. Uh, uh, by Jason, uh, who hosts our uh, Taoism meetups on Tuesday evenings. And Sunday, one of the most exciting series that we have going on. Uh, it's with the Center for the, for the Study of Digital Life. Uh, China retrieves, retrieves its chi and leapfrogs the West and, uh, at three and the three spheres. Uh, east, I don't have the whole title out there, East, West, and Digital. Um, so those are the upcoming meetups, and that's at Sunday at 3 p.m., and that's every Sunday for the next few weeks. That it really is one of the more exciting meetups we have coming up. Uh, we are also covering the design way on Monday. Uh, I believe we're covering section nine of the book. I'm not sure, but I think that that was the section that we'll be covering. And so uh, I appreciate everybody coming this evening and look forward to seeing everybody again soon. Thank, every thank you, everybody. Thanks for your comments.